Somebody say, all I see in 23 is victory. Tell somebody, all I see in 23 is victory. We've had church. We could just go home. But I sure do like the word. I like preaching the word too. What do you see in 23? Victory. What is victory? What is the victory that overcomes the world? Our faith. What is our faith? Believing and speaking. Believing and speaking. I see victory in 23. You know why? Because God didn't create me to be defeated. God didn't create me to be a loser. If God is for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can't lose because I've got victory on the inside of me. I'm, a, I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me and died for me and gave himself for me. So thankful you are here today. It's an honor to have you worshiping with us. A, a full house here at Forest Park. Can we just give God praise for that? I mean, that is... absolutely amazing and I've got I've got a short time to this plane to take off and land so hang with me we're gonna go quick if you have your Bible and you want to turn there open to mark chapter 5 mark chapter 5 I had a different message prepared actually last Sunday a different message but this week the Holy Spirit stirred in my heart and said we're going a different direction and so I don't, I don't debate and I don't argue. I just say, okay, you're in charge. We'll do it your way. And I believe I have a word from God for somebody today. It might just be for one person. It might be for somebody watching online, but this is a word from God for somebody today. And I've entitled this message, A Tale of Two Storms. A Tale of Two Storms. God, we thank you. Your presence is in this place. Don't let anyone walk out of this room, God, like Jacob, and say, surely the presence of the Lord was here and I did not know it. May we recognize that your Holy Spirit is here. That, Father, even now you are removing limitations off of minds, off of bodies, off of futures. And you're opening doors, Father, that we just can't praise you enough for. We are thankful you have done great things and we are glad. And we give you all the glory. Now let every mind be alert and every heart be receptive is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groanings of his precious blood's atoning and I repented of my sin and I won the victory I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and he calls the blind to see so then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory if you know it right there in your seats can you sing it with me oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is due him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood are you thankful that your victory was purchased by Jesus Christ. And because he's victorious, he has made you victorious. Every year we speak a word over the year. The word this year is victory. Now we have a vision as a church. And this year I felt led to 
update the vision as a church that'll go with us for years to come. And the vision of City Gate Church is this, rescue, build, equip. That is our vision as a church. If, if you have locked arms with City Gate Church, I want you to make that your vision as well. We are called to rescue, to build, and to equip. What does that mean? We rescue the lost, we build the found, and we equip the believer to go out and rescue the lost, to build the found, and equip the believer. To go out and rescue the lost, build the found, equip the believer. To go out and rescue the lost, build the found. There are lost all around us, folks, waiting on somebody to rescue them. But it's not enough just for them to come and get saved at an altar. We got to build up those who have been found. And then we have to equip them. That's what Paul said the job of the leaders are. To equip the saints. To do what? To go back out and rescue the lost. To build the found and equip the believer. And I want to focus on that word rescue. Rescue. You may feel like you're doing pretty good today. But if you're, I want to say this in the words of the old preachers, if I may. Whenever the old preachers would talk about a storm, they'd say there are three types of people in this room. There are people in a storm, people coming out of a storm, and people heading into a storm. But we all in a storm. I guess that's one thing we could all agree on this morning is all of us are in a storm in one way or another. And I want to talk to you about a tale of two storms. You know, when you get into a storm, you may have been through some storms and you say, I can handle it. I've been through storms before. I can handle it. But there is a level of attack you can't handle on your own. And if you ever go through it, you'll have to cry out, help. I need rescue. And hopefully somebody will hear your cry and bring you the rescue you need. Mark chapter 5. There's nothing I can leave out of this, so I'm just going to go ahead and read every verse. Go figure that we'd read the Bible at church on Sunday. I know this, said, this, is, a new, this is the new trend. Chapter 5 of Mark. So they arrived at the other side of the lake. Now, there's a whole story that went on before this. Jesus told the disciples, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. When they got out into the middle of the sea, a great storm arose and the boat filled with water. Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat on a cushion. And they went back to him and said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? He woke up, wiped the sleepy out of his eyes, looked around and said, it's just a storm. Peace be still. And the storm stopped and the waves laid down and the wind stopped blowing. And he turned around and looked at the disciples and said, where is your faith? Where is your faith? What's he saying? Why didn't you believe and speak to the storm? And in just a moment, I'm going to show you. Jesus saw what only faith could reveal, that there was more to the storm, more to the storm. And now they're on the other side of the lake. Spoiler alert, they made it through the storm. In the region of the Gerasenes, you've also heard it referred to as the Gadarenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist, smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered through the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and this is powerful, bowed low before him. Bowed down. With a shriek he screamed, now, I know this is translated different ways in different versions, but I love it in the New Living Translation. Listen what he says. Why are you interfering with me? I got a good thing going on over here. 
Why didn't you just stay on your side? I wouldn't have bothered you as long as you'd have stayed on your side, but why'd you have to come and get in my business? That's what the devil is saying to Jesus. Why are you interfering? Had a plan. You're messing it up, Jesus. Son of the most high God. You know what's amazing about this? Not even the disciples believe at this time that he's the son of God. Isn't it amazing that the devil could see what his own followers couldn't? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus, now what he's going to do, he's going to jump around in the timeline. He's going to, how it, what's going to happen in the end, but then he'll go back and give you context. That's how Mark is writing this. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside of this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again, do not send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The devil has to ask God for permission. Do you hear what I'm preaching to you? I'm not even preaching yet, but I'm already giving you great revelation. The devil has to ask God for permission. Jesus and Satan are not equals duking it out and we're hoping Jesus wins. <laughs> Satan doesn't even compare to Jesus. He has to beg him for permission to do anything. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered into the pigs and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Kim and I went to the Bahamas one time and when we landed, there are these pictures in the Bahama airport of these pigs in the water. And you can pay, you know how you can go swimming with dolphins? You can swim with pigs. Pigs are excellent swimmers. But when the devils got inside of them, the pig said, you may have put up with it, but we're not. They refused. And here's what I noticed. When the demons got in the water, if pigs are good swimmers, but they drowned in the water, maybe it's demons that can't swim. And maybe if I get an evil spirit in an outpouring of the Holy Ghost... The devil can't swim in these waters. The herdsmen fled to a nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. The crowd gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons. But now he's sitting there fully clothed, perfectly sane in his right mind. And they're afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man, told them about the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus, go away, leave us alone. The reason people get upset at a move of God is because when someone gets free, it's a declaration you don't have to live bound anymore. But when somebody's been so comfortable in their bondage, They'll get upset as somebody who gets free. As Jesus was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. There's a lot of begging in this scripture. And Jesus said, no, go home to your family. I love this. Are you ready? Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Can I tell you the requirement on your life? If you've ever experienced freedom, you have a requirement to go home and tell everybody of how good the Lord has been, how good Lord has been to you and the mercy he has shown to you. Let me just, let's go ahead and give it a test. Has the Lord been good to anybody in this room? Has the Lord been merciful to anyone in this room? So the man started off, pay attention, to visit what was called a, a decropolis or decropolis or 10 cities. 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. 
Lord, bless the reading of your word. I got to go quickly in the reading of this. When I look at this man, there are some keys to understanding what a spiritual attack looks like. And I want to talk about the storm. This man is in a storm, a demonic storm. The source of his storm is the devil, and it is affecting his life. It is affecting his family. It is driving him from any sense of a normal life. Here's what I've noticed. Number one, this is a sign of a spiritual attack. He's been like this a long time. It's amazing how long a person can live under a demonic attack. You learn to tolerate what you should be casting out. Let me show you how this can work. The demon will convince you that fear is normal. And so you'll learn to live with it rather than speak to it and tell it to get out of your life. Fear will make you afraid of what a day would be with life, without it. I don't know if I could live without fear. I've had it for so long. Other people learn to live with the spirit because it's a generational spirit. The grandparents let it in. They passed it down to your parents. Now your parents have passed this spirit down to you. So you think it's just normal. And so you tolerate what you should be casting out. The man had no clothes on. This demonic spirit had stripped him of his clothes. Here's what this means. You start sinning with no shame. Paul calls it a seared conscience. Don't ever, ever, ever Think something's wrong when you sin and you feel conviction. Conviction means you can still hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. What you should be concerned about is when you sin and feel no conviction. And what we're seeing in a culture today is there's more and more of a culture that is sinning with no shame. That's an evil spirit. Dwelling in death. Notice he made his home in the tombs. He's alone. He's allowed the enemy to separate him from anything that resembles life. He's still got people in his life. They're just all dead. He's just not spending any of his, any of his time with people who are alive. When an evil spirit starts attacking your life, it'll drive you from any, sim, any form or any sign of life. It wants you hanging around dead people in dead places. So when you get around a church full of people who are alive, it'll try to drive you out of this church into a church that has no life. A study showed, here's how important it is to do life with other people. A study showed that there is an absolute correlation between mortality and the degree to which people are alienated or lonely. Lonely people become sick far more often than those who live in family units or with friends. What's the devil doing? He's drawing you away from your source of life. You want to live a long time? God gave you the local church. He gave you, well, Pastor, I didn't have a good family growing up. He gave you a new family called the church. And we can be your family now. And you can find friendships and relationships in here. Well, Pastor, nobody wants to be my friend. Okay? Go find someone lonelier than you and be their friend. Then you'll both have a friend. God doesn't want you in dead places. Jesus said the thief comes. Not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And then notice when Jesus says, tell me your name. They respond, legion. This man isn't fighting a demon. He's fighting an army. There will be moments in your life where you know there's an evil spirit attacking me right now. There is a spirit of fear. But then there are moments where Satan just opens the door and sends the army after you. And you got fear on this side. And you got complaining on this side. And your kids are acting up on this side. And you get a bad report from the doctor, a, a spirit of infirmity attacking you on this side. That's an onslaught of, an, of a demonic army coming against your life. He's fighting an army. Notice that they said we are legion. A legion in this time is a group of soldiers numbering over 6,000. 
Over 6,000 demonic spirits have taken residence on the inside of this man. Why, did, why didn't they just say we're a lot of spirits? They said we're legion. How in the world did this man get a legion of demons on the inside of him? I mean, what was, was it a Ouija board? What was he messing with that, that, that 6,000 spirits got on the inside of him? Jesus told us. It's not here. It's in another place. Jesus said, when a spirit goes out of a man and he wanders through dry places and can't find any rest, he comes back to his original abode. And when he finds the house swept clean and put back in order, he doesn't go back in. He goes and gets seven spirits worse than him. And they all come back in. You battled one. Now you got eight. And they come in and the end of that man is worse than the beginning. You know what, know what he's telling us? You better not play church. You better not get in here and get something cast out of you, but not get filled up with the Holy Ghost. Because you go back there, they come in and say, well, look, somebody cleaned up the house for us. And they get seven spirits worse than them. And they go back. And that, that's why Jesus said the end of that man is worse than the beginning. We're not here playing church, folks. We have fun. I, I'll, I'll crack a joke every now and then. We're going to have a good time. We're going to be creative. But we are not playing church. You get something knocked out of your life, you better get something back into your life. And that's the Holy Ghost. What's your name? Legion. Notice he didn't say, it's just a bunch of demons. He said, Legion. What he's saying is, we are organized, we are regimented, we are ordered. There is a hierarchy going on on the inside of this man. Generals, captains, lieutenants, sergeants. That's, they had ranks. They said we are organized, we are regimented. But you know what the big idea is? They said we are in unity. We are legion, for we are many. They spoke with one voice. You can go through this Bible from Genesis to Revelations, or some of the old preachers said from Job to Malachi. You can go from cover to cover, and you will never find one time where a demon fights with a demon. You will never see a demon talk about another demon, gossip about another demon, harbor bitterness against another demon. I ain't working with him. I don't like him. You'll never see a demon tweet about another demon. You know why? Because they understand their power is in their unity. And when they speak, they speak with one voice. We are legion for we are many. They understood what Jesus said when he said a house divided against itself cannot stand. You will never see a demon fight a demon, but just come to church. And this one's mad at this one, and this one's bitter against this one, and this one won't forgive this one, and this one won't sit here because they're over there. How are you going to cast out the same demons that you're allowing to divide you? He breaks chains. There's no control. There's no restraint. Here's what he's saying. Here's a big idea. Don't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want. You just do you, boo. Don't you tell me how to live. Don't you tell me how to, don't you tell me how to, how, don't you tell me the Bible says I can't do this. I'll do what I want to do. That's what that man said. Nobody can control me. Nobody can make me do something I don't want to do. I'll, I'm living for me. And when Jesus steps off the boat, he runs and he falls down and notice what he says. Don't torment me. The very presence of Jesus was tormenting to this spirit. 
He ain't even opened his mouth yet. Jesus hadn't said a word. And the guy's going, you're tormenting me. That's the power of presence. But watch him. He's worshiping. You are the son of God. Stop bothering me. Stop interrupting my plans. He's worshiping and cursing, confessing and complaining. What's going on here? Have you ever seen anybody do this in church? Worship in one moment, start cussing people out in the next moment. They're in the parking lot. We've seen them. We got one entrance into this church. We got one exit out of this church. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 is, it is the sanctification road. <laughs> so if, you, if, you, if you ain't sanctified, that one entrance in and one entrance out will get you sanctified. How in the world do you have somebody worshiping with one breath and cursing in the other? The presence on the outside started to reveal what was going on on the inside. This is what happens. You can come into church, you can be happy, but all of a sudden the worship starts and you feel something stirring on the inside of you. You start getting angry. Why does the music have to be so loud? Why do they have to have so many lights? I really don't really like his preaching anyways, but yet you keep coming back to church. You come back every Sunday, every Sunday, and complain the whole time you're here. What's happening? The presence in the house is revealing the spirit in your house and he's revealing it so you'll beg God to deal with it. Worshiping and tormented at the same time. God's exposing it so you'll let him deal with it. The demon spirit recognizes what you don't. You're about to have a God encounter. You're about to have a God encounter. Now, I told you this is a tale of two storms. This man is in a storm. But if you go back, the disciples had just been in a storm. They got in the boat. A storm arises. The boat is filled with water. The boat is spinning. They don't know which way is up, which way is down, which way is forward, which way is backwards. And they turn around and say, Jesus, don't you care about us? We're perishing. Where is your faith? Jesus saw by faith, not by sight. He saw that there was a source to this storm. Not every storm is natural. There are some storms that are spiritual. Gatherings is significant because it is a stronghold. There are 10 cities that make up this area. There is one man that has become bound by the powers of darkness that is affecting these 10 cities. And the devil knows as long as I got this man, I got a stronghold in these 10 cities. And then Jesus says, we're going to the other side. And one demon tells another demon who tells the chief demon, we better send a storm to stop them from getting across this lake. Because if they get to this side, we're going to lose our stronghold. Well, how are we going to stop them? Somebody send a storm. You tell the principality of the air to start whipping up the winds. Tell them to send the thunder. Send the lightning. Tell them to cause the waves to fill the boat. Tell them to hit them with a storm. Storms always show up. Whenever you set your mind, I'm going to break this stronghold. Here's a big idea. This storm isn't about you. Look at somebody and tell them, this storm, it ain't about you. I know you think you're a big deal. It ain't about you. No, the devil sent the storm to stop you. Because on the other side of this storm, there's somebody that's about to be set free. And if they get set free, 10 cities are going to be set free. So I got to send the storm to stop you so you don't get to the other side. It ain't about you. Tell somebody it ain't about you. The storm came for the man to stop his purpose. The storm came for the disciples to stop his breakthrough. The storm had to get to you before you got to it. The storm wants you to stop before you get to the shore. 
The storm wants you to stop at the halfway point. Why? Because if I can stop you at the halfway, I can keep this man bound. If I keep the man bound, I'm going to keep all 10 cities bound and everybody in the cities bound. But if this brother ever gets set free, then all these cities are going to be set free. So cue the storm. I got to stop them with the storm. But the storm wasn't about them. The storm was about. See, the devil won't mess with you as long as you think everything's about you. Why am I going through this storm? I must be really important, aren't I, God? It ain't about you. No, there's a purpose on your life. And if you ever make it to the other side, Something's going to be broken. Something's going to be released. Chains are going to fall. It might be a storm to stop you from setting the person free who's going to set the street free, who's going to set the community free, who's going to set the city free. And so the devil sent the storm to stop you because you were the key that was going to unlock their chains. He wants the man to run to the shore and find out you gave up. How many people are running to the shore for their deliverance just to find out that you turned around at the first sight of a storm? And I think that's why when he saw them, he started crying out, woo! Because he didn't expect them to make it through the storm. Who was responsible for the storm? I can hear the demons. Who was responsible for the storm? I told you to send a big one to say, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, Captain. We sent the biggest one we had. Their boat was filled with water. But even though it was filled with water, it still wasn't sinking. We threw the best we had at them. But they kept coming. They kept coming. They kept coming. Guess what the devils didn't count on? You had Jesus on your boat. Yeah, you wouldn't have made it, but Jesus was on the boat. I, this storm can't take me under. Jesus is on my boat. And if Jesus is on my boat, we are going to the other side. And when we get to the other side, deliverance is coming with us. Freedom is coming with us. Power is coming with us. Jesus is on my boat. Somebody give him a big praise. If Jesus is on your boat, storms can't stop you. If Jesus is on your boat, problems can't stop you. If Jesus is on your boat, fear can't stop you. If Jesus is on your boat, storms can't stop you. If you got Jesus on your boat, give him a praise. And if you're in the room and you're going through a storm, but you know this storm isn't about you. You know it's about what you're about to do. You know somebody's about to get set free. Go, oh, the devil sent a storm to some of you because you're about to break a chain. You're about to break a chain of generational curses and generational bondages and generational sickness and generational. So he had to send the storm to stop you. But I need somebody look at your community, somebody look at your family, somebody look at your friends and tell them, help is on the way. Help is on the way. Help, I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna make it through this storm. Help, somebody shout help is on the way. Shout to your family, help is on the way. The storm hit you because the devil saw you coming. That's the only reason he sent it. The storm is to stop one man from delivering 10 cities. That's why this man's possessed because he's got a, he's got a purpose on his life. And we can't let, they saw at a young age, we got to get this fella at a young age. That's why he's been like this a long time. Because he's got a purpose on him. And if this man ever fulfills his purpose, we're going to lose our hold on 10 cities. The other storm came to stop a boat from delivering a man who would deliver 10 cities. What I'm saying is you don't know what storm has come against you because of who you're about to set free. It's bigger than you. Tell somebody it's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. Storm was never about you. 
It was about who you're going to set free. Be seated for a moment. I'm going to go quickly. I want to tell you a little bit, a little bit of the history of City Gate Church. My uncle, his name is Arlie Petrie, and he's my dad's older brother. And my dad talks about what it was like growing up with Arlie. He said, he said Arlie became incredibly strong, so strong he could hit a punching bag, a punching bag, and split it open. Arlie became an alcoholic. Terrible, angry alcoholic. And at night, he would come stumbling in through their back door of their little house and drunk, completely drunk, barely able to stand up. And as he walked through the black back door, my grandmother would be in the bedroom praying, Lord, save Arlie. Lord, save Arlie. And he had to walk in that back door hearing his mother pray for him. God saved Arlie. He gave up alcohol, never touched it again. He became a great singer, songwriter, and a preacher and started evangelizing. Then a storm hit Arlie's life. He was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and there was no cure for it at this time. Nothing they could do. He was laying in a hospital bed. My dad said he went from 185 pounds down to 80 pounds. His throat had swollen shut. He couldn't even drink any liquids because of how closed his throat was. He's laying there in a hospital bed and he's dying. His wife and my grandmother went to a small revival church service in Indiana. And they walked up to the front, my grandmother praying, Lord, save Arlie. Well, let me back up just for a moment if I may. The doctors came to my grandparents and they told them, you need to get everything ready. He's going to die. So they went home and my grandfather went to Arlie's closet and started picking out a suit. And my grandmother walked in and said, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm, he said, well, I'm picking out the suit that we're going to bury Arlie in. She looked at him and said, that's what you think. Now go back to that church service. They're down front, Lord save Arlie. His wife turns and looks at the clock that was on the back wall. At the same time they were praying, Arlie was laying in a hospital bed and God spoke to him audibly three times and said, Arlie, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. And immediately the healing power of God hit his body, his throat opened up, he reached grabbed the drink on his table, drank the whole thing, and then reached over to his neighbor's table, took the drink off of that, and drank all that too. God healed Arlie completely of Hodgkin's lymphoma there in that room. Arlie had to get out. He had to do what this man did. The Lord has been good to me. He's been merciful. I must tell everybody. i got to tell everybody. So Arlie went back to preaching, but he didn't have the strength yet. He hadn't built back up the strength to stand for that long and tell the story. So Arlie picks up the phone and calls my dad, who is not a preacher, and said, hey, will you, will you go with me and help me? I need you just to help me stand behind the podium to tell my story. So my dad started traveling with his brother Arlie and he would stand there behind the podium and he would hold him up so he could tell the miracle that God had done for him. Well, finally, my dad got, I guess he got bored standing there and said, well, if I'm going to be here, I might as well start preaching too. So then my dad starts preaching. Well, now they become a team and they're traveling all over evangelizing and many people are being saved, being baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. So they get an invitation to a church downtown Cincinnati on 15th and Ray Street. And they said, we want you brothers to come and hold a revival at our church. They accepted. Before the revival began, Arlie got on his knees and he prayed for 13 hours straight without getting up. The revival went for 13 weeks, sometimes multiple services a day people being saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost. They would take them down to the Ohio River to get baptized. Now that's great faith. If you'll get in the Ohio River, you've got great faith. 
Well, years go by and the church's pastor retires and that little church said, let's send a committee to go and ask Leon Petrie if he'll come be our pastor. Well, they went to my dad. My dad said, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in being a pastor. I'm an evangelist. So they gave it a little time and they said, let's send another committee and let's ask them a little stronger this time. And my dad accepted. And in 1967 became the pastor of 15th and Ray Street Church of God. That would move to Town Street in Bond Hill. In 2007, my dad would retire. Myself and Kim would be installed as the pastors of Town Worship Center, which would become City Gate Church. From there, God would open a miracle door for a building in Lebanon. And from there, three years later, God would open a door for a building in Forest Park. What am I saying? I'm saying the storm that came against Arley wasn't about Arley. You were the ones on the other side of the storm. You were the ones. And if he would have given up, we wouldn't be here right now. But because he made it through the storm, look at you, uh, you and I, look at us. Look at us. You can stand to your feet, I'm done. We are here today because one person said, this is bigger than me. He didn't give up and look how much freedom has taken place, not just here, but in Lebanon as well, because he wouldn't give up. Not only that, but his wife and my grandmother, those two powerful women of God who stood in faith to pray, we're the harvest on that. Do you realize that? All of us here today, we are the harvest on that. So I'm saying all this to encourage somebody. I don't know what storm you're going through. You're going to make it because it's not about you. And Jesus is on your boat. You're not going under, you're going over. You're going over to the other side. And somebody, it might be your children, it might be a loved one, is about to be set free. And they are the key to winning a community, winning a street, winning a city. It could be, they might be the one that unlocks a stronghold in a high school being saved. That's the power of enduring your storm. Now maybe you're in here, but you're in the storm. It's demonic and it's power coming against your life and you don't know Jesus as your savior. Well, God has brought you to the shore today to experience freedom. And I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer with me all over this room, if you will. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Erase my past. Jesus, I believe. You died for me. You were buried for me, but you arose for me. Because you live, I will live also. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now look right here at me. If you prayed that prayer, made Jesus the Lord of your life on the count of three, raise your hands quickly. Do it quickly. One, two, three. Shoot it up high.